Crosspoint, everybody. We're so glad that you joined us. Uh, everybody here in person and online. Uh, we're so, so glad that you're here today and uh, just to worship our King. And uh, we'd ask that you not sing in person, but online, sing as loud as you want.
There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire. Was standing next to me, there was another in the waters, holding back the sea. Should I ever need to remind me of how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears a burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. All my dead left for dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. Should I fall in the space between all the names of me and this reckoning? Either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. still is and will be through it all. So come on, may in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning. I know I will never be Cause I 
Good morning, Crosspoint. It's good to be with you this morning in the room and online. I want to let you know, men, next Sunday is Father's Day. And whether you're a dad or not, as long as you're a male of the species, you can register for the Father's Day raffle on the homepage at Crosspoint or the link that came from Pastor Bruce on Friday. We're giving away some great prizes, similar to how we did for Mother's Day. I'd love to see you be included in that. We had a blood drive not too many weeks back, and it went fabulously well. We're having another one July 15th. It's really important to our community to uh, have those in storage. And so we're gonna help rally our church, our community to give blood on July 15th. You can sign up for that online as well. Sadly, I need to report to you that Hume Lake uh, just this week canceled all of camp for the summer. We are super sad about it as a church. We're sad in the youth department. Of course, the kids are sad. It's uh, been a hard, hard few months here on the kids and our students. And I wanna call you, Crosspoint, our church family, that for the next week, pray for everything, pray for the church. But if you can put special emphasis on our kids and our students who have suffered loss in so many different ways through what these crazy days we're going through, uh, just pray for their blessing, pray for their peace, pray for their encouragement, pray for their faith. And uh, let's rally around our kids and our students this week in prayer. God bless you today. Good morning, Cross Point. This is looking more and more normal. Isn't it exciting? Isn't it a little bit sad that we consider this a big step toward normal? You look amazing, by the way. I can see some of your faces. Welcome. Folks at home, welcome. So glad that you're here. We're going to read a psalm together. We're going to be reminded that we're not the first people to love God and go through a hard time. Sometimes the people who love him most suffer the most deeply. You're going to hear that from King David in Psalm 56. But before we do that, I just want to thank you again for the incredible way in which you've rallied as a church family. As soon as this, let me just give you from a, a pastor's perspective, as soon as this began, pastors across the country started having conversations. We started texting each other, we started calling each other, we started emailing one another saying, they didn't mention this in seminary, what are you going to do? <laughs> the response was pretty unanimous, we have no idea. And pastors, just like every other human being, have dealt with their own fears and their own losses. One pastor told me, speaking of another friend without mentioning his name, he said, if this goes on for two months, I'm afraid we won't make it. Like we, won't, we won't exist when this is over. And everyone who has leadership or influence in any organization had to ask himself or herself those kinds of questions. I'll tell you again, in so many ways, scattered as we've been, this has been your finest hour. You have loved you have given everything. I keep joking about it, but you've given your time, your talent, your effort, you've given your money, and you've even given your blood, and you're about to give it twice. 
I mean, literally, what else can a human being give that you haven't already given? I love it. And I am so grateful because this is what it means to be a Christian. Anybody can sing in the sunshine. Anybody can profess faith when there's no storm. It's the rough seas, it's the dark nights, it's the uncertainty, it's the loss that makes Jesus shine if we will cling to him and act like him. So whether you're here in the room or for those of you who are uh, online, on your couch, in your bed, I don't even want to know how you're watching, I don't care. We love you very much. I am excited to hear from people all over the country and through our missionary family from all over the world. I'm grateful to be part of this church family. If you're part of the missionaries that we support, we are delighted to partner with you in circumstances that I know are much harder than the ones we have endured in the United States. And this family of faith on this corner, we love God and we love you. And folks, let's just keep it going. We're writing a great story of faith. We're writing a great story of generosity. We're headed in the right direction. Let's not give up. Let's not stagger and blow it at the finish line. Let's not blow our testimony and embarrass ourselves and give Jesus a black eye after all that we've already endured. Are you with me? That was enthusiastic. Let's pray so we can give together. Father, whether people give online as so many so quickly learn to do, and that, that's been extraordinary, Lord, for people who don't do hardly anything online, maybe only email, for them to buy electronic devices, get coaching, ask questions, to know how they can continue to connect and participate. That's been a beautiful to see. I echo Pastor Jim's prayer. This has been especially hard for our students and for our children. I pray that you would bless them. But I thank you that in the midst of these losses, I've also heard parents say that for the first time, they're being very intentional, very purposeful in teaching their own children the Bible since they can't have children's ministry in the way we normally do here on campus. So in all things, Lord, you always have a counter move. And you've never lost so help us keep trusting you. Help us keep loving each other. When we offend or misunderstand each other, help us be quick to give each other the grace that you first gave us. And however and whenever it is given, Lord, thank you for the privilege that we have to give. We give this to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.
pray together again. Heavenly Father, that's a gospel song that, familiar as it is, never fails to move me because it portrays the truth that on the cross and at the cross of your son, something extraordinary was happening. For the first time in all of time, because you have always been there, you turn to your son and though you never stop loving him or being faithful to him, you treated him as if he were guilty and he took our sins upon the cross so that when he rose from the grave, we could rise with him spiritually and have eternal life. And he faced your justice so that we never would, so that we could always and only call you our Father, never our judge. Thank you. We love you. Help us to learn from those who have gone ahead of us to cling to you as they did in times of trouble. In Jesus' name I pray. I'd like you to open your Bible in two places this morning. The first is an important place to give you the backstory of a song. The Psalms, which is where we're going to end up, we're going to end up in Psalm 56. The Psalms are songs, they are poems, they are the songbook of Israel. And because songs, music at its best, reflects every bit of life, so it wouldn't be appropriate to sing a very happy, cheerful, goofy song at a funeral, nor would it be appropriate to sing a dirge or a lament at a birthday party. Psalms cover it all, but they're written in real time by specific individuals, and sometimes we're told in the musical notes that come before the Psalms who wrote them and what they were going through. Maybe like me, you've sometimes wondered what the story is behind a particularly and very popular song. For years, for instance, people have wondered what the most California of all songs, what Hotel California was actually about. And I grew up with all kinds of wild theories and stories, and then somebody had a great idea. They asked the band. And don't look up their answer right now. This is a very different kind of music. In Psalm 56, we have a psalm of David, but it has a very specific occasion, and it's one that David would have found humiliating. So, keeping in mind that we're going to Psalm 56, I want you first to look in 1 Samuel, where we're told the life of David. I want you to look first in 1 Samuel 17. And I want you just to note that the editors of your Bible have probably put a title above chapter 17 that tells you that you're about to read one of the most famous Bible stories of all, right? What's 1 Samuel 17 about? David and Goliath. Goliath is a little brother. He's too young to go to war. His father sends him literally to take his brother's lunch on the line. And while David is there, he discovers that all of Israel is acting with cowardice. Because day after day, a Philistine champion comes out and mocks them and curses them by their gods and says, send somebody to fight. There's no need for the armies to clash. I'm the best. Send me your best. We'll see what happens. And day after day, no one steps forward. Not even Saul, who was beloved and trusted by the people in the beginning because he was the tallest man in Israel. His cowardice is evident. So David, who's really there just to deliver a cheese sandwich, says, why isn't somebody doing something about this? That's God he's insulting. I'll take care of this. And Saul and his cowardice says, well, you better take my armor. Imagine that. Imagine being an experienced warrior who doesn't want to go to war, but you'll loan a kid your armor. And David staggers around with it and says, I can't use this. I don't know anything about this. And he takes the old familiar weapons of the shepherd, a sling and a few stones, and he walks out, and in a moment, it's over. He fells Goliath with one sure shot, cuts his head off, 
and the armies of the Philistines run for their lives. And then people made a song about David. Look in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 6. It says, as they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, with musical instruments, and the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. You get the point? Saul's pretty good, King's pretty good, but David, have you seen what David can do? Now, there's a man. How do you think that went over with King Saul? Not super well. The editors in my Bible say in chapter 19, this title, Saul tries to, do you have the same one? Saul tries to kill David. And David runs for his life. And David was reduced to eating whatever he can, including the holy bread. He's running for his life. He's done absolutely nothing wrong. He's been given an extraordinary blessing from God because David was willing to trust God in a way that no one else would. And for his trouble, he has to run for his life. And in 1 Samuel 21, verse 10, we read the occasion that caused David to write the psalm that I'm briefly going to explain to you. 1 Samuel 21, verse 10, it says, And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. Now, if the names are not familiar, I have some bad news for you. Achish is the title or perhaps the name of a king, and Gath is in a foreign enemy territory. Can you guess where Gath might be? Philistine land. Does that make any sense to you? doesn't make any sense to me, but a man does what he has to do to survive. David runs for his life into enemy territory, comes into the, into the city of Achish, the king of Gath, and the servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. How do you think David feels right now? Put yourself in the situation if you can. If you don't understand the context for the song that David is going to sing in Psalm 56, it won't have nearly the impact the tr of the truth that God would want you to have on it. How's David feeling at this moment when he's recognized in enemy territory? Oh, by the way, the same enemy whose champion he killed earlier. How's he feeling? Pretty good about it? No, because no matter how strong you are, one man in enemy territory all alone with a murderous king in his own nation right behind him is in a tight spot. What would you do? Would you invite maybe them to bring out another champion and to give you a chance to get your sling? Here's what, here's what David did. David took those words to heart and was much afraid, much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath which goes to show you that even the strongest people who have had the greatest victories with God can be deeply, terribly afraid. It's a new day. See, as we've moved through all of this, maybe you've made the same mistake that I've made where you're having a good day, you're feeling great trust and great confidence, and the next day it takes a dip. And you feel afraid and you feel confused and you're angry with yourself thinking that you're maybe you're losing your mind. No, that's the way real life works. David is a man after God's own heart. He is the future king of Israel, but right now he is in such deep trouble that he is, we're told, very much afraid. And look how he escaped with his life. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. You understand what you're being told? He acted crazy. He scratched up the gate. He let spit run down his beard. This is more shameful than I can possibly explain to you in an ancient culture that is based on honor. 
the same shepherd boy that said, that guy, he's nothing. Give me a second. Let me get my sling. I just need to go down to the river and get a few rocks. I'll be right back. He's in a new circumstance. He's got his king who he has loved and served and defended behind him, and now he's literally in the hands of his enemies who are saying, hey, we know you. You're the most famous warrior. Well, guess what? You don't have your sling now, and there's a lot of us. And he sees a glint in the king's eye in this place where, la where life is so cheap, where people are not only killed, but they're often disemboweled and tortured and have their bodies and on display as trophies. David knows all that. He's about to have it happen to him, and he acts like he's completely out of his mind and purposefully lets his spit run down his beard. I couldn't harm you. I'm crazy. You have nothing to fear for me. I don't make any sense. I don't even know where I am. I don't even know who I am. Don't worry about me. And it works. And I love the king's answer. There is so much kingly frustration in these two verses. Listen to this. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see, the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Isn't that like the most man in charge thing you could ever possibly say to your staff? Well, you brought a crazy guy here? I got plenty of crazy people working with you. Well, you want me to bring him home? Get him out of here. And David, head down, beer wet with spit, walks home with that enormous relief that we sometimes have when we realize we thought we were going to die, but somehow we have escaped with our life. And after all that, he wrote a song to tell you what he learned. Would you like to hear it? It's in Psalm 56. Psalm 56. Notice the title. It says, To the choir master according to the dove on far off terebinths. Now, what is that? That's the melody. It's lost to us, but David is saying, Sing these new words to this old and familiar tune. A mictum. We're not even sure entirely what that means. It may be a musical term. A mictum of David, notice, when the Philistines seized him in Gath. In other words, this is the song that David wrote, and this is the song that David sang, and he wrote it for Israel. This is the song that David taught Israel to sing after he was so terribly afraid. And you're going to notice that he recounts every bit of his experience in just a few verses. It's a song. And what a song is going to do is take you through either a joyous moment or a moment in the valley, and compress the experience into a few poetic words, but make no mistakes, songs teach. In fact, one philosopher said, I don't care who writes a nation's laws if you'll let me write their songs, because songs teach people and move people. Always be careful with the music you imbibe, because it will shape you. And I would recommend that you be shaped by the songs of the people of Israel the songs of the first people of God, because they went through every possible thing, guess what, including plague, and those things are mentioned in the Psalms, that you have ever gone through or ever will, and they came out on the other side with things to teach us. I'll move around a little bit, but I want you to hear David's lament. Verse 1, be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me all day long, an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. Can you understand why he wrote those words now? They literally have their hands on him. He's dead in a moment if a positive ID is made and someone in charge says, kill this man. Look down in verse 5. All day long they injure my cause. Every other major translation says, all day long they twist my words. Have you been through any of that ever? Anybody ever twisted your words? Do you see any of that happening in national media these days? Just a little bit. 
My pastor used to say there's always one fact that you don't know that changes the whole story. But the way the pace of news works, nobody can get the whole story. So everybody runs with the outburst and the outrage. And the people who were there and know better would say, if they could, that there's more to the story. Who's doing that? Everybody's doing that. That's happening on all sides of the political spectrum in every kind of issue and every kind of story. And it's painful. It is painful to have your cause, your honor injured, to have your character spoken of, to have your words twisted. All day long they injure my cause, all their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife, they lurk, they watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For their crime will they escape in wrath, cast down the peoples, oh God. That's David's pain. But in the middle of all that, in the middle of this lament, I want you to see where David put his trust. Go back with me to verse 1. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me all day long, an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. Did you catch that? That's at the heart of the psalm. That's what David learned to do. He did it once with Goliath. He learned to do it again in Gath. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? And you think he's through it. He gets it. Why is there more psalm here? Doesn't it sound like verse 4 would be a great place to end the psalm? But he didn't. After saying, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? He goes back. He slides back into sorrow. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever thought, I get it, I'm through it, I'm fine now, and the very next day, you're down again. Has that ever happened to you? That's life. That's grief. That's how it works when they're really after you. My pastor used to say, it's not paranoia if they're really after you, and he's right. And they're really after David. Real harm, real injury, real fear surges up again. He laments for two verses. He puts his trust in God for another two verses. And then he's right back in it. Verse 5, all day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited for my life. And then he calls on God's justice. For their crime will they escape in wrath. Cast down the peoples, O God. He calls for God to act, act as he did in the day when he faced Goliath, act as he promised he would because David was his king, act as, he, as God promised he would because Israel was his, were his people. His mind goes in another direction because that's the way grief and fear works. If you've noticed, he's gone from lamenting to making this rock-solid affirmation, when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. Then he's back down in the depths. Then he's calling God to account, saying they've committed crimes. Step forward and be the angry judge. Surely you can't see this injustice and stand quietly by. His mind goes in another direction. This is a precious verse. If you've never seen it, I'd encourage you to underline it and remember it. Verse 8. You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? There's a lot there. Let me explain it to you. David said, God, I'm all over the place. I'm tossing back and forth. Another translation says... In verse 8, you have, kept count, you have kept count of my wanderings. Because that's what it feels like when you're afraid. When you're afraid, you go first in one direction and then another. You think this is the right direction to take, but then fear grips you and you stop and you go back in the opposite direction. And 
people who love me who have seen me in that exact condition will eventually say something like, I wish you'd make up your mind. Are you going to be mad or sad? Are you going to do something or not? What, what exactly is going on? This is grief. This is fear. And then he says, you have kept count of my tossings, put my tears on your bottle. What does that mean? That's poetry. That's a great lyric that if there were Google would have sent people who just heard it on the radio or on Spotify for the first time to figure out what does it mean to put tears in a bottle. Well, you have to remember David lives in an arid climate. All the water they're going to drink is naturally occurring. They're not going to the water store to put a big, giant, five-gallon bottle under an easy spigot to take it home. Both water and wine are carefully kept in big vessels and treasured up because they will save life. And David says, God, my tears are so precious to you that you're catching them and keeping them. Some of you are going through the worst time of your lives because you have believed, as David and every person who has ever suffered with God has, at some point you have feared that in your suffering you were alone and you never are. No, God sees you wandering and tossing and he's keeping count of it. It's one thing to wipe away tears. Many times we've wiped away tears quickly because we don't want them to be seen. They embarrass us. God not only dries tears, David says he catches tears and he keeps them. He keeps all of those pains, David says, changing the image, same idea. He keeps all of your troubles in a book. Whatever you're going through, your father knows it, and he knows it better than you do. He hasn't been surprised through any of this. Have you? Have you read the news through any of this and said, what now? I mean, a while ago, it was murder hornets. Did you see that story? What next? Somebody else sent me a fake news story that said sniper monkeys were now on their way to America, and I thought, of course, that's... That's all we're missing are specially trained sniper monkeys. But then another friend sent me another story that squirrels with flamethrowers were also headed to America, and I thought, well, maybe we can befriend the monkeys and have them fight the squirrels. <laughs> this has been odd. This has been strange. It has caused and amplified every emotion and every thought that anybody could ever have. Some people are desperately afraid, but they won't say so, and the only way they're showing their fear is through anger, not sorrow. And I want you to know, if you have God, and that is the crucial question, if you are in relationship with God, he does not stand aloof from any of this. In fact, he records your wanderings, he catches your tears, he records your troubles in a book. Verse 9, David says, Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. Here's an astonishing statement. This I know that God is for me. Think about that just for a second. Because we actually might need to not believe this, but to marvel at it again. David, the man who, having no other recourse, pretended to be broken psychiatrically and pretended to scribble on the gate and let spit run down his beard when he survived that brutal experience he came forward with this conviction god i've been all over the place and at times i lament and at other times i tell you i trust you at times I ask you for your wrath to fall on these people already and at the same time I remember that you are so near and so tender and so compassionate that it's as if you were catching my tears and keeping them in a bottle. And here's what I've learned from all this. I, you are for me. And the trouble with that in 21st century America where almost everybody has been taught by everything including and especially marketing from birth that it's all about you, your inclination might be to say, well, of course God is for me. I'm awesome. And I need you to marvel again at the idea that the God you know 
through the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, who made the whole universe and everything in it, who alone is holy and just and righteous, who raises up kings and puts them down as if they were nothing, who the Bible says the clouds above us are like the dust of his feet. That God who speaks all of creation into existence when he chooses to do so by the mere power of a word spoken, that God in Christ is for little old you. What could possibly be better than that? And this is a thousand years before Jesus arrives. David is actually going to write some of the Psalms that prophetically tell us that Messiah is coming and that Messiah will suffer and that Messiah will die and also rise. Look with me, hold your place because we're nearly done, but I want you to see how much God is for you in the fullness of the New Testament as God's revelation continues because David, even writing that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, could scarcely have imagined how much God would be for the people he saved. Look in Romans 8, 31, please. Romans 8, verse 31. Everybody have it? People at home? We've moved from Psalm 56 to Romans 8, 31. It's very important that you read this with me. We're nearly done. Paul wrote, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Listen, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Wow. Jesus is speaking to the Father on your behalf. Because God is for you. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. In other words, we may find ourselves as helpless as David was. But in all of those things, Paul says, no, in all these things, including fearing for our lives, including actual persecution, under the shadow of the threat of death, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure, find your situation here, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the church said, that's what it means for God to be for you. It doesn't mean he's a fan. It means he's a king who has come to rule on his terms. And by his gracious invitation, you submit to his rule, turning away from your sin, and you enter the family of God, and the creator and the king and judge of all the earth now becomes your father, and he is for you. No wonder David said in Psalm 56, in God, Psalm 56 verse 10, in God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. Here's the point of Psalm 56. Since God is for me, I will not be afraid. I will just do this. I will just keep obeying Him. The verse... The psalm, rather, didn't end much earlier when David said he was not afraid because he made an amazing discovery. Life is spared. Life is extended. Blessing is given, not so that you can go on and do your own thing, but so that you can go on loving, serving, praising, and obeying God. Look again in verse 10. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? But you should. He's spoken. He's saved. He's acted. 
He's for you. Have confidence. Move forward in faith, not to do what you please now, but to obey him now more than ever. Can we pray together, please? Let me speak to the folks who may be still watching at home. Because this crowd is so small, I'm reasonably sure I know most of the people here, but maybe not. Maybe you're in the room and you've been wondering about your relationship with God, and maybe you're at home watching this, not knowing if God is for you because you've never given your life to Christ. Let me be clear, until you repent of your sin and entrust yourself to the mercy and the forgiveness of Christ, God can't be for you. You're opposed to Him. How could He be for you? But the grace of the gospel is that God invites you to lay down your rebellion and trust him instead. And in that moment, you're not only loved and forgiven, but God himself is literally your advocate, your champion to fight your battles for you, to keep you safe through trials on earth. Then he turns the greatest trial of all, which is death, into beautiful, glorious, eternal life. And death really is crushed underfoot by the resurrection of Jesus. So whether you're here or online, if you've never trusted Christ, let me invite you to do so now, to turn away from your sin and trust him. And if you have questions about that or you're ready to do that, please send me a text message. This number, 714-868-7258. 714-868-7258. Just text the word Jesus. Just that. 714-868-7258 and the name Jesus. If you'd like prayer, if you'd like to connect with us, same number, just text the word welcome. We'd love to pray for you. And whether you're here in the room or watching online, I just need to remind you again, in Christ, you don't have to be afraid because God really is for you. It's the best thing anybody could tell you. Not that you'll figure it out, not that you'll be strong enough, not that you'll be smart enough, not that you can be better, but that the God who runs everything, who is perfect, who doesn't need to get better because he's literally perfect already, that God is on your side. He is for you. Amazing. And Christian, what are you going to do with all that? I hope and pray, and my challenge has been, okay, I've been given all this, I've been given this assurance, how am I going to obey God with it? What have I been holding back? What have I been denying Him in my obedience? How have I been repaying this amazing message that I don't need to be afraid because He's for me? How have I been walking with God in the light of the life He's given? Father, we love you. Thank you for telling these astonishing stories in your word of people who remind us so much of ourselves, who have such reason to be terrified, and we can feel fear as we read their stories, we reflect on our own lives. We can remember being mistreated, being hurt, being afraid like that. Thank you for this message that you have told us. Amen. God bless you, folks. Love you very much. I am so glad that you've come out. Folks online, this concludes the 9 a.m. service. Thank you so much for joining us as always. If you need help, if you need encouragement, and more and more people do, please reach out to us. We're right here for you. You can't see us all the time as you're used to, but God is for you.